This coming week, our devotional readings together revolves around a word that there is never too much of. And it is most always appreciated when it is presented to us. And it is the word kindness. Kindness. The world can use a whole lot more of that. Let's think about this important word as we continue this year to share the word by sharing a word. And if you haven't gotten your copy yet, you can catch up. If you haven't got your devotional reading book, let us know. We'll put that in your hands and you can get caught up and read with us as we study together this year. We talked back in December about a new program that has been put in place by the elders that at that point was to be put in place and now it exists. And that is where the elders have decided to do the majority of our benevolent work this year through you. You have the contacts, you know the people. You may have had situations where I'd really like to do something, but I don't have the ability to do that. And so $200 was placed in your hands to use as you would see fit with just the request. There's a white box out there. Let us know. Uh, the good story that came with that. We're calling that our good news box. As things are shared within our community one to another in a way to bless other people, I'll be sharing several of those stories this morning. Some, several have already been turned in. And since our topic today is kindness, I think it's only appropriate to interweave some of these stories that you've already shared uh, with us this year. Instead of random acts of kindness, we're calling it kingdom acts of kindness. You can still sign up and participate, by the way, if you haven't already done that and would like to. It's on the bulletin board. Here's one that was turned in the end of January. It was a very sad situation. The death of a close friend's newborn on the down in the southern part of the state. $200 was provided to the maternal grandmother on behalf of the parents to assist with funeral costs that they couldn't afford for their infant son who passed away on January the, the 23rd, two months old. What a, what a tragic thing. For a family to go through. And yet, uh, one of our good families saw the need and reached out to help in that regard. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. I'd like to look at kindness today by looking at a particular moment in the life of Jesus. You'd be hard pressed to look at any moment in the life of Jesus without finding the word kindness involved in one capacity or another. But in the Gospel of Luke, beginning in, in chapter 8, beginning in verse 40, we see Jesus showing kindness to two people who were entirely different. The only thing they seemed to have in common was their good fortune in coming upon Jesus on this day when they needed kindness. One was a man, the other was a woman. One was an outcast, poor and unknown. The other was rich and influential. By the time of this story, Jesus has already achieved a, a large amount of acclaim and notoriety among the people and performing miracles had caused people's eyes to be upon him. And of course, Jesus always not only took that moment to seek to try to help other people physically, but he also wanted to teach them about the spiritual need that each one of them had within them and how that they needed 
to make a decision with their life relative to him. People swarmed him wherever he went, and the demands on his time were severe. Yet on this occasion, we see it happening over and over again. Jesus is willing to be stopped and be troubled by specific individuals that he would encounter on a daily basis. No one was less important or more important than another. And by the way, where you sit today, that's exactly still the same. We're all equally important in the eyes of our Savior. One passage before we read the Luke 8 passage. Matthew 20, 27, beginning, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's read now together this familiar text from Luke chapter 8. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there was a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him and said, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. And when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she's not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. With such extraordinary things taking place, it doesn't seem reasonable to say what I'm about to say. This is just an ordinary day in the life of Jesus. But it was. Who's going to be benefited by His kindness the next day and the next day? And who else was before that day was over? It was an incredible moment of blessing for these families that we read about in this text and so many others throughout Scripture. But it just helps us be mindful of the nature of Jesus. Just the kind of compassionate, caring Savior that He is. And how when we are given opportunities to be His arms, His hands, His voice, His legs to others around us, it only elevates that activity in our own lives when we remember that we're doing this for our Savior. Consider that the plans of kind love make room for interruptions. We're not sure where Jesus was going when the story begins, but it's obvious that He changes directions when Jairus comes to Him with the desperate need of His little girl. All acts of kindness are not planned. They are seized when the opportunity 
arises. As I've said before on many occasions, all of us ought to be making our daily plans in pencil. Because we may have opportunity to change those plans in a better way for what we can do and should be doing rather than what we had planned to do. I have another note to share with you. It's dated Saturday, February the 11th, around 7 p.m. As I entered a small retail store, a man lay asleep, but so still. As I left the store, he had turned. Someone was kind and left him a bag with dinner. As I slowly approached him, carefully not to startle him, I placed a care bag next to his head, thanks to Gold Hill. I hope he awakens with a clear mind and will be safe and realize that there are still caring people in this world. How do you handle interruptions in your schedule? Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. For he that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Before Jesus can reach the destination of Jairus' home, a woman touches him. The apostles are a little astonished that he said, somebody touched me. It seems on the, the surface, they're basically saying, Lord, who hadn't touched you? There's a big crowd here. Everybody's touching. He said, no, they touched me with a lowercase t. She touched me with a capital T. That's my words. She reached out seeking specific help from him and no doubt knew within herself as Jesus compliments her faith that Jesus was indeed the Son of God and was someone who could profoundly change her physical circumstances. Jesus was kind to the multitudes, but he knew them personally. Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That kindness that we extend to those around us needs to be personal and it needs to make a difference. James 2 verse 14 beginning asks the question, what does it profit, brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Good, kind words are very appropriate to everyone. But you can't digest them. They don't make your body warmer. I'll just speak for me. I've been guilty of that. I wonder if the story of the, the Good Samaritan and the priest and the Levite who came and saw the man in, in dire circumstances, I just wonder if they didn't do what I do from time to time and throw a passage at him. Now, you know my love for the Word of God, and I'm not in any way meaning to insult that. And it is that Word that needs to leave with, live within us, and it is that Word that saves our souls. So, having said that. 
But he didn't need a speech at that particular point in time. He needed someone to put him up on their, on their beast of burden and to carry them in the city and to house him and to care for him so that he might be made well. One of the greatest tools of evangelism in our world is the example of Jesus. When we care with the heart, we touch the flesh with needs that are genuine and follow that up with the need of the soul. Because ultimately, what's more important? Well, obviously it's the spirit. They're going to be hungry again. Going to get cold again. The flesh only goes so far. But Jesus always found opportunities to help people each day with his tremendous kindness. And by the way, here's a sermon to help you digest that wonderful meal that I've just provided for you. That is the formula that we see in our Lord. Share another story. I've been in contact with Christina for a few months now. She works at Walmart and is in charge of the online grocery pickup. She was having a hard day. I gave her a hug and we exchanged numbers. We've talked a few times and just recently I was checking in and she said she was struggling financially. All of her bills were scheduled to be auto draft and she didn't have the money to pay to have her car repaired. It was $184. God is so good. We had just prayed about keeping our eyes and hearts open for those we could bless with this gift. Christina is a single mom who lives with her parents after leaving an abusive marriage. She has a super sweet heart and I've been able to share some different scriptures to help encourage her. She does want to get involved in a church but works on Sundays. I've invited her to come on Wednesday nights, so hopefully she'll be able to make it soon. We're so thankful to be part of this neat ministry and are hopeful and prayerful that we'll be able to continue sharing our many blessings with others. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Nothing without love. Our world is growing more impersonal every single day. And we as the body of Christ are the counterculture. We've got to get more personal every single day. Chasms are being opened up around us each day because of coldness and unconcern and rudeness and malice. Yeah, it's a little discouraging at times, but let's consider this. That only makes more room for your light to shine. It's a darker world. Hey, I'm going to step in. If you want to tell your wife you love her, press one. If you find out what's needed at the store, press two. If you fail to remember today is your anniversary, press 911. <laughs> Might need a little help for that one. We'll close with this. The plans of kind love are made only after listening to the need. There is a targeting that needs to be a part of what we do. You don't just throw stuff out there and hope something works. I remember growing up where my grandparents and mom and dad grew a garden. And I remember being chastised for being undisciplined with the seed. <laughs> All right, Jeff, get in there and 
toss that seed. Whoa, you know, just. <laughs> you see that furrow right there that we dug? Cast your seed down there. And we'll cover it up and it'll grow. Otherwise, you're just throwing it to the wind. We need to be listening to people and provide a, a targeted answer to the things they need. That comes because we get involved and we actually know something of each other, which requires some time and some energy and some devotion. Sometimes we don't know what to do because we're unwilling to take the time to listen to both verbal and nonverbal communication. Jesus took the time in Luke 8 to learn what the needs really were. And that was so kind. James 1.19, be swift to hear. Proverbs 19.20 Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Proverbs 19, 22, what is desired in a man is kindness. Ephesians 4, 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. We talked about forgiveness. Maybe one of the kindest things you can do is to forgive one another just as God in Christ forgave you. Maybe there's somebody here today who needs to follow Rosalind's wonderful example this past week. Allow your faith to be that which takes over your life. To truly believe in something beyond yourself. To know that this life is going nowhere unless the Lord is a part of it. Are you willing to turn from your sins, repent, own Jesus verbally and to be baptized so that your sins can be washed away? Mark 16, 16. Can we help you? Let's leave here kinder people than we came as we stand and sing.